Hey, it's a plant based business hour. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. Great to be back with you after a little vacay. I did get away, but I'm back with you now. So happy to be here. Mycoprotein, you might have heard this word already. What is it exactly and why should we care? We go right to the source. We're going to the rise of mycoprotein plant in right outside of San Francisco in Sacramento with my guest today, the CEO of the Better Meat Company, Paul Shapiro, is with me. Paul, thanks for being here. Elizabeth, welcome back from vacation. As a listener of yours, I'm kind of sad you're on vacation, but as a friend of yours, I'm glad you were on vacation. Sure did need it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but the podcast kept on coming. I, I recycled some stuff from before yeah. I even started the plant-based business hour. So uh, hopefully people got a taste of some other stuff that I do. But but more importantly, speaking of taste, I wish that we could be together today in person because we've been talking about how I can get to the Rise of Plant to taste what you are up to. Before we dive into Riza, what is it? Mycoprotein, what is it? Uh, single cell fungi, what is that? And why do we care? First, let me sing your praises. So here I go, everybody. You probably already know Paul and how great he is, but just in case you don't, let me do it for you. Paul Shapiro is the author of the national best-selling book, which we all know and love, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize, revolutionize Dinner and the World. Of course, he's the CEO of the Better Meat Company, four-time TEDx speaker and host of the Business for Good podcast, my go-to podcast after my own. <laughs> so, uh, Rightly so. For, for those who can see us on Twitter, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook, you have a bunch of pipes behind your head. Tell us where you are. Yeah, well, welcome to Sacramento. Uh, I appreciate you saying we're right outside of San Francisco. That's how we feel. I don't know if the people in San Francisco feel that we're right outside, but that's how we perceive ourselves. Uh, but, you know, I, I'm going to explain what all of this is about. But before that, let me just talk briefly, Elizabeth, if you don't mind, about how we make plant-based meat today. Because right now, nearly all of the meat that is sold in the plant-based world is coming from one of three crops. It's coming from soy, coming from wheat, or it's coming from peas, or it's coming from some combination thereof. Now, if you notice, all of those have one thing in common. They are all plants. And plants are very far, evolutionarily speaking, away from animals. So it takes a lot to get, for example, a pea to have the texture and taste of an animal. So what you do is you have to grow a field of peas, let's say, mill it into a flower. Now you have a pea flower that's not that high in protein, so you fractionate it. You remove that fiber, remove that fat, concentrate that protein down so it's a plant protein isolate. So it's like a pea protein powder that it, like a you know, bodybuilder might take. But the problem is that it still doesn't have the texture of animal's meat. So then you subject it to extrusion, which is basically a lot of heat and a lot of pressure that changes the structure of the protein. So it goes from being globular, like a plant protein, to stringy, like an animal protein. And that's the basis for how we get plant-based meat today, or at least the base ingredient of a plant-based meat. Um, so you have to do all of that because plants, again, are very far away from animals. However, there is another kingdom altogether. Not plants, not animals, but fungi. And fungi are really amazing. They're amazing because they are not in the middle of plants and animals. They are way closer to animals than they are to plants. And so just as an example, if you think about, you know, we as animals breathe in oxygen, we breathe out CO2. We all know plants do the opposite, right? They breathe in CO2 and sequester and they breathe out oxygen. Well, uh, similarly, fungi breathe in oxygen just like animals do. That's how much closer to us than to plants they are. They breathe in oxygen, they breathe out CO2. Also, um, you know, plants just put themselves in the sun and photosynthesize, whereas animals and fungi have to search out for the food and, and digest it. And that's one more reason what we know, for example, that fungi are just way more animal-like. And this is why mushrooms have a much more meat-like texture than do plants. Mushrooms are way meatier than plants. And this is why in Asian cuisine, for example, mushrooms have been used for centuries as a meat substitute. However, there are a few deficiencies, mainly that mushrooms are not that high in protein. So rather than using the mushroom, which is the fruiting body of the fungi, you can use what's called the mycelium or the mycoprotein. And this is the root-like structure underneath that mushroom that is high in protein. And often many of the species of fungi actually have a very meat-like texture. So what we're doing here at the Better Meat Co is subjecting our, uh, myco, our little microscopic fungi to a type of fermentation where, like for example, think about how a cow eats grass, right? And then over a long period of time, that cow converts grass into a steak. 
while our little microscopic fungi are eating potatoes and they're converting those potatoes into something that looks and tastes like meat through a fermentation process. And unlike a cow though, not only are our microbes not conscious and sentient and suffering, but also unlike a cow, uh, you know, you don't slaughter a cow for like, you know, 14 uh, to 20 months or so, depending on how the cow was raised. Whereas we are running this fermentation where we're harvesting our little mycoproteins in less than a day. So we go from potatoes to meat in less than one single day in this system here behind me. And that, I know it seems like magic, but it's not magic, it's just science, it's fermentation. And so what we're capable of doing is essentially using the fungi kingdom and all the amazing things it can do, making an alternative meat that is a whole food. It's so meat-like in its texture that we don't have to fractionate it and isolate it and extrude it just straight out of the fermenter. It automatically has the texture of animal-based meat. And so it's a whole food. It's not an isolate or a fractionate. It's a whole food that we offer that is delicious, succulent, and meat-like without the need for all of these steps to process it into something that looks and tastes like animal meat. Uh, you got that, everybody? <laughs> I don't know. Let me let me dissect a couple of things here. This is, you know, so much to unpack here. Now, Ryza, which is your mycoprotein, your fungi, is not a mushroom, right? So they're not all fungi are mushrooms. Do I have that right? <laughs> you do have that right. So uh, mushrooms are the fruiting body of the fungi, right? So it's kind of like the apple is the fruit of body of the fruiting body of the tree, right? Right. However, um, about ninety percent of fungi do not produce mushrooms at all. So mushrooms and fungi are not synonymous. Mushrooms are the fruiting body of some fungi, but most fungi don't produce mushrooms. Uh, so we're dealing here with really the, what the, the portion of the fungi that goes underground, that's in the soil and that is crawling around in there looking for nutrients to eat. Yeah, which is so awesome. So help me again as I try to uh, understand the science. Um, all fungi are microbes. Do I have that right? Well, they, they, when you talk about the spores of the fungi, yeah, those are like microscopic, essentially. Um, you know, it's kind of in the same way that the spores of animals, so to speak, um, are also microscopic, right? So you have to look at it under a microscope to see if you're fertile, for example, for a man. Uh, but in the same way here, they, yeah, you're talking about things that are happening at the microscopic level. And eventually, they become macroscopic. So you can see them with your naked eye once they've grown up enough. But when you're just dealing with the spores, that you're talking about something that is uh, very small. So when I think of microbes, um, again, you can tell me if I got this right. I think of microbes and plants make protein. People and animals do not. So... I think of microbes as very quickly and prolifically being able to reproduce and produce protein. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. In fact, you know, in, in nature or biology, like normally the larger the organism, the longer it takes to replicate, right? So it takes an elephant a long time to make more elephants, right? It takes humans less time, it takes chickens even less time, mice and rats even less time. But when you get down to the microscopic level, it's rapid. That is rapid growth. And so now instead of, you know, waiting for weeks or months or even years to replicate, you're talking about hours. And that's yeah. how we are able to go from inoculating our fermenter to less than a day later harvesting a fermenter that is completely full. It's really remarkable. You can see hour by hour just visually how much growth there is by looking in the cycle glass of a fermenter and seeing the mycoprotein growing in there because it is so rapid. Yeah, that, that is really so, so cool and so awesome. And, and just kind of as a side note, one of the major issues that we're trying to solve on a global level isn't just getting uh, rid of animal cruelty, which we're all desperately trying to do, but also we have to feed about 30% more people on the planet as we go from about 7.6 billion people to 9.8, so about 25, 30% more, but you're not getting more land and you're not getting more water. So as you look, as we all look for ways to nutritiously in better packages, so that would be packages that have fiber as well as protein, meat, meat doesn't have fiber. Uh, we'll get to your package in just a second. As we look to produce more nutritious packages for people globally around the world, we look to do it more prolifically as well, using less resources. Um, so microbes, of course, uh, requiring less land, less water, if any, I don't want well, to miss some, they, your plant is on some land, of course, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that, all the benefits of this, this production, but for sure, as you've already mentioned, rapid, rapid, rapid growth, and that really helps for quantity and volume, which is so key. Um, let me ask you a, a couple other things. 
I've never heard of Ryza before. Are you the only plant using Ryza? And how is Ryza similar or different to corn? Sure, great question. So uh, first, Ryza is just Greek for root. So it's the name that we have come up with for our product. Um, so it's kind of like corn is the name for their product. Ryza is the name for our product. Okay. However, uh, to answer your question directly, so corn, Q-U-O-R-N, is a really uh, p pioneering company in this space. They've been using fungi fermentation for decades now to make their product. And uh, I really have not the utmost respect and admiration for their company because they have done amazing things to show that you can do this. There are differences though. So in the same way that you would say, for example, you know, what are the differences between using soy protein or pea protein? Well, they're different species of plants. So they have different characteristics. Well, corn's species that it is using is very different from our species, not even the same genus actually. And so the fungi kingdom is massive and we are scratching the surface, just barely scratching the surface, looking at what all of the thousands upon thousands of fungi species out there can do for us. And this is one of them. And so while I am a big fan of corn, I do believe that our product is better and more meat-like. I, I view corn kind of like um, a, a novel category of food. I, I eat it and really enjoy it, um, but I view it as a novel category of food. I don't think it tastes so much like meat as much as I think it tastes good. Like I enjoy eating it, I like eating it, but it doesn't make me think of meat per se. Whereas um, I think when you eat our product, you really do think this is a meat-like experience. And you know, my view is that most people want meat. I wish that weren't so, um, but most people want meat. And it's kind of like if you walk into a room and you flick a light switch on in the room, you know, what you want is the experience of an illuminated room, right? You want light. Um, you're not so much thinking about whether there's renewable energy powering that light or whether it's fossil fuels powering that light. And I think the same is so with meat, that people want meat. They don't necessarily think about whether an animal was tormented and slaughtered for that meat or not. In fact, if they did think about it, they probably would prefer that no animal was slaughtered for it. But most people just want the experience of meat, just like we want the experience of light. And if we can provide that same experience in a way that, as you have so many times correctly pointed out, Elizabeth, is going to uh, mimic not only the experience, but the taste, the texture, the uh, price, and the convenience of the product, people will be quite happy to switch, just like they'd be happy to switch to renewable energy if it was the same price for their light in their house. Yes, but I must say, you're only telling half the story because they're switching, they're getting all these things that they want, this experience, but they're getting oh so much more. So go yeah. ahead, let it rip. The list of Ryza is enormous in terms of the nutritional package. Take us through that. And then also I want to hear how you discovered, can I say it's discovered? I'm sure there are other scientists who knew that this existed, but um, for the processes processes of making meat, how you came to connect with Ryza. But first, the nutritional package, let it rip. Sure. I'm so glad you asked, Elizabeth. So you correctly pointed out a moment ago that people need fiber, right? So everybody's talking about protein. We're such a protein obsessed society, but neither you nor anybody you've ever met is protein deficient. Uh, you know, virtually everybody who's listening to this has way more protein than they need. And nearly everybody listening to this is not getting the fiber that they need. 95 plus percent of Americans do not get the recommended daily allowance of fiber. And, you know, where do you get fiber from? As you point out, it's not from animals. You know, animals have skeletons. That's why we stand up. Plants don't have skeletons, so they need fiber to hold them up. That's why plants have fiber and animals don't, because we've evolved different ways of holding our bodies up. And we use uh, skeletons, they use fiber. And we need fiber. Uh, you know, getting not getting enough fiber is not just going to cause you to be constipated, which is bad enough, but it's going to increase your risk of colon cancer and other really serious ailments. And so one way to eat more fiber is to eat more plants or, or and or it's also to eat uh, more fungi. And with our product, Ryza, it's extremely high in fiber. In fact, it has more fiber than oats do. But it's not just oats. Uh, excuse me. It's not just fiber. Um, it's got more protein than eggs. It's got more iron than beef. It's got, again, more fiber than oats, more potassium than bananas. And really coolly, because it's a product of microbial fermentation, it naturally contains vitamin B12. So if you think about it, like in the plant kingdom, you know, there's no vitamin B12 out there, right? Because we just associate that with animals, but it's not actually the animals. It's microbial is the reason why they're having it. And so this product has everything you want from the protein and, and, and the fiber and the B12 and it's a whole food and it doesn't have you know iron or or um b12 because we're supplementing it it just naturally contains it on its own and so this is like a true superfood in the real sense and so while i think you know this you know it's wonderful to have the uh plant-based business hour 
but we might need to expand to be print and fungi based. So I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. But we'll see. Rebranding um, a la yeah. Paul Shapiro. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I will say, of course, uh, in, in the defense of calling it plant based, um, you know, I think if, if, if you go to a restaurant and they're serving a portobello burger and they call it their plant based option, nobody's going to accuse them of false advertising, right? Like, even though we know portobellos are not plants for fungi. So I'm all for it, uh, but I joke around. But yeah, I think the fungi kingdom needs, uh, needs some better PR here. It needs a better, it's a better publicist. So uh, I want to add two little bits of information and then get to the second part of that uh, equation. So, you know, just imagine the animals are eating all of these plants. So what they do, the plants have fiber, as Paul just said, what they do is they concentrate the protein, wrap it in some cholesterol and saturated fat, and they poop out all the fiber because fiber it goes through them. So you're getting that package with the protein, but you don't get the fiber, you're getting the saturated fat and cholesterol instead. You're also getting things like TMAO, trimethylene anoxide, animal heme, et cetera. None of these are present in microbes, fungi, uh, and plants actually. So um, I want to know I, I want to know now how you came to trip upon Riza. How did sure. this journey come to be? Yeah, it's a great question, Elizabeth. So, you know, we did screen lots of different species of fungi. And, you know, we're looking for things that are going to grow fast, accumulate a lot of protein and have a meat like texture. Um, so, you know, you want it to grow fast because you want it to be economical. Our goal is to be cheaper than the cheapest meat. We are already competing on cost with beef, but we want to compete on cost with chicken. And so we need to we need to be cheaper than we are. And the way to, there's a lot of ways to achieve that. And we're going to do it. But what we've got to do essentially is, 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 you know, look for what are the best fungi, what are the best species and strains that we can utilize to create that experience. So we tested a lot and we ultimately settled on one that, you know, it's not exactly uh, novel. There's lots of published literature on it. Lots of uh, people are interested in this. It's actually a, a very highly studied species of fungi. Um, but we developed some new applications that are particularly effective at making it grow in the right for the I have lost your audio. Um, you still hear me, right, Elizabeth? And now I got you. I lost your audio there for a second, but you're back. Okay, sorry. Um, I don't know what happened. Anyway, point is, uh, if you look at, you know, let's just say that you, Elizabeth, you wanted to start the Alfano egg farm, right? I know that is not real. But let's say you're going to start the Alfano egg farm. And you, you would go and you would get chickens of the modern strain of laying hens who are going to be laying a lot of eggs. But if you went and got chickens from 100 years ago, they're only going to be laying a few dozen eggs a year. Chickens today, though, have been selectively bred by, uh, by the egg industry to lay about 300 eggs per year. So it's way cheaper for you to use modern strains of domesticated laying hens than those from a century ago because they're just so much more productive. Well, those of us in this space are essentially using like wild strains of fungi here that are not optimized for this purpose. And we're already competing on cost with beef. Imagine if we can optimize these uh, microbial strains to actually become more rapid growing or more protein accumulating or more meat like in the texture, what you could accomplish. And so, you know, we're again, scratching the surface of what's possible. And I am really looking forward to making a strong effort to not just take what we are given, but to actually improve upon it and, and create the equivalent at the microbial level of like a second domestication. So that, you know, uh -huh. thousands of years ago, we domesticated animals and plants to get them to lay more eggs, put on more meat, you know, whatever we wanted from them, right? Well, you know, we're gonna have a second domestication and it's not gonna be with animals, it's gonna be at the microbial level. And we're gonna create alternatives to this horrible way that we've been producing meat for too long by tormenting slaughtering billions of animals and creating a better way to do it. Mm -hmm. We've talked about your base product, Riza. Now let's talk about what you do with it. So we will get to a factory yeah. tour in just a second, everybody. Oh, yeah. But oh, yeah. uh, I, I want to understand, are you adding flavors and um, spices? Or is that, you're a B2B company. You don't sell this to the public with rare exception. There are a couple of restaurants, but you, mostly you're getting this to other, primarily meat producing companies. We'll talk about that in a second. But just stay with me here on the final product. So now we're, we're understanding how to grow Riza, the fungi, and uh, do it quickly and do it with fewer ingredients and really capitalize on this as a low cost high protein, high fiber, very nutritious, B12, the whole thing. So great um, opportunity. But are you structuring it? 
or how do how do the other businesses buy it from you? Already structured, like here's a piece of steak, and they just have to season it, or you're seasoning it. Tell me about the end products and what you have. Sure, uh, you know our goal is to remain as a B two B ingredients company. We do not intend to make a bunch of steaks and chicken breasts and ultimately sell those. We want to empower our customers to do that because our customers much bigger and have the scale to actually make a dent in the marketplace. So, you know, we're not trying to compete with the big food companies. We're trying to get them to have a lower footprint on the planet and on animals and on public health themselves by empowering them with our technology to do that. So, yes, you're right. We've done some selling at a steakhouse in Sacramento and so on. And that went very well. We're very proud of it. But the purpose of it was to showcase what our ingredient can do. It was really to demonstrate that it can make a really succulent steak. That you don't have to just do ground meat with alternative proteins that, you know, most of the alt meat out there today is, you know, burgers, dogs, sausages, meatballs, sticks, and so on, uh, which is just, you know, ground for meat, whereas we can actually do whole muscle milk in addition to ground meat because of the nature of the texture of this product. So we made a steak and it was very popular. People really loved it. Um, but our goal is to sell to food companies, whether they want to make plant-based meat with it, which is fantastic or even if they want to blend it into their meat. And in our last conversation, I, I gave a passionate defense of, uh, of this strategy to help make companies use fewer animals. It's not that vegans and vegetarians like you and me always with would be that interested in eating those products, but I do think that there's a case to be made that uh, you, know, you can help these meat companies use a lot fewer animals by giving them a way to do it. <clears throat> so that's where we're going as an ingredients company is selling this as an ingredient both to make plant-based meat and to make um, blended meat but we'll continue selling the ingredient as a uh, dry shelf stable product and then they can hydrate it in the same way you know that let's say you know beyond meat or impossible foods they they buy dry protein isolates today that's what they do um and in the same way you know they would then buy our dry shelf stable product they could then make their own products with it I see. Okay. So you're not seasoning it for them or structuring it for them. It's up to them to yeah. do what they will. And sometimes they'll add it to their current meat products, but sometimes they'll yeah. hopefully switch to a completely plant-based product or microbial yeah, that's, based product. That's it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so we do offer it in what we would call in formula, which would mean seasoned and everything else. So you, if you want a turnkey solution so that you want it to taste like beef, you want it to taste like chicken or crab or whatever type of meat you're trying to mimic, um, yeah, we can offer it that way, but most of the time people really want to make their own products with it. Yeah. So I want to ask a question for Betty Ann Cornwall. I think she missed the beginning because she's asking about, is it healthy? And we talked about just how healthy it is. You've got all that fiber, no cholesterol, um, no saturated fat, you know, grading your protein, getting your B12, all these great things, potassium, et cetera. But she's saying, well, how does it taste? So um, <laughs> you, you did have, again, you're a B2B company, but I think two weeks ago, you did have a version of your steak. You did your own final product just to have for one night at a lucky steakhouse the first American steakhouse actually to serve a microbial steak really will go with a plant-based steak there. So um, how did it, how did it go and what did it taste like? I'd encourage you to check out the, the, the photos at bettermeat.co again, bettermeat.co, but it was wildly popular. People loved it. It's succulent. Uh, the owner of the steakhouse said it was the best alternative meat he'd ever eaten in his life. And I really believe that again, this is just scratching the surface. You know, what we're doing with it is, like 1.0. There's so much more that can be done uh, with this product. So we are very proud of that steak. I think it's fantastic, but it's just one step among many. Uh, as another example, we were named as a semifinalist in the X Prize competition to make a whole muscle chicken breast without the chicken. And so we made a really succulent chicken breast of Riza and uh, were recently awarded a semifinalist. So we're now still in uh, we're still in contention to become the winner of the whole thing. And the XPRIZE is running this $15 million competition uh, to have a you know, whole food um, chicken or fish. And so we're, we're competing for that right now. And we feel, uh, we feel good about our chances because the product really speaks for itself. It's delicious. People love it. And it can only get better. And who does this XPRIZE? I'm not sure I know about it. Uh, uh, yeah, so XPRIZE is a cool competition. They generally have like these moonshot competitions where they offer millions of dollars if you can solve a problem. And so it used to be that it was sounded really for space exploration. Like, you know, you'll get this much money if you can create a rocket that can safely return back to Earth and be reused as an example. Uh, but now they have this $15 million competition for any company that can create a, a whole muscle mimicry of uh, chicken breast and fish uh, without animals. And so, yeah. you know, you think about just how difficult of a problem that is that they would offer $15 million to do it because you know, nobody has this. Nobody 
be out on the market is selling steaks, right? It's all burgers and meatballs, like I said, and chicken nuggets and so on. Um, so it, it's just tough to do. It's technologically challenging. And uh, we're doing it. We're doing it. And the way we're doing it is by not relying on plants and instead re relying on fungi fermentation. Yeah, it's just so brilliant. And as much as I want to sing your praises, and oh, I do, I'll say that you're not the only person who got the memo on this. If you look to the Good Food Institute, uh, between 2010 and 2019, about $3 billion were invested into alternative proteins. In 2020, 3.1, so all of 2010 and to 2019 together uh, and more, were invested in uh, 2020 for alternative proteins. And a third of that was for microbial fermentation, biomass right. and precision fermentation, whereas the years before it was non-existent. Yeah. So I think a lot of investors as well as scientists, et cetera, are, are seeing the impact that we can make on our food supply system with this low cost, prolific, nutritious microbial fermentation process uh, and the nutrients coming from the microbes themselves, the fungi themselves. So, uh, right. so very cool, so very cool. Let me ask you, what's the reception been from the meat companies? Because ultimately you do really supply meat companies and your goal is to get them to either go plant or microbial based or to get them to at least reduce their meat processes. So what have they been thinking right. of this? Uh, all I'll say, Elizabeth, is that since we announced the completion of construction on our plant last June, it has been a stampede of companies coming here to tour, to taste, and to try the products. So numerous of them are using our products now in trials and seeing how it performs. And I can assure you that the response is overwhelmingly positive. It's the most meat-like. If you were to take texturized pea protein or texturized soy protein and eat that on its own versus eating rhizo on its own, without even knowing that it's a whole food or any of the other benefits, just on texture alone. It's a dramatically superior product, way more meat-like in its texture. And so you, there's lots of things that are being done to find ways to, for example, more effectively and more inexpensively uh, uh, extrude to texturize plant proteins. But what we're doing, I'm all for those, that's fantastic. But what we're doing is figuring out ways that you don't have to take those costly steps and can instead just through fermentation create a meat-like texture, which is exactly what we've done. So I'm a big believer in extrusion. I think it's wonderful, um, but it's kind of like, it, you know, if you think about fossil fuels, like the problem of fossil fuels is so severe, it's so pressing. You want lots of alternatives, right? You want wind, you want solar, you want geothermal, you want a whole suite of alternatives of clean energy. Well, in clean protein, you need a lot of alternatives as well. So extrusion is one. You want uh, plant-based, you want uh, microbial and fungi-based, you want animal cell culture for Cellular, producing yeah. cult cultivated meat. There's lots of different ways to peel a potato. And that's, you know, what we're doing is just one of those ways. And I'm particularly enthused by the statistics that you're mentioning from the Good Food Institute about fermentation. Much of that money that's going into it, though, is going into what you referred to as precision fermentation, which is basically using microbes to produce specific types of proteins or other um, ingredients that people want, like whey protein or casein or egg white proteins and so on, which is different from whole biomass uh, per, uh, fermentation, which is just uh, a, a lot cheaper to do. Um, it's, it's a lot cheaper to do. And so um, for a variety of reasons, uh, but I, I'm all enthusiastic about the precision fermentation. I think it's awesome. I love eating my brave robot ice cream. So thank you. Perfect day for God, that. I love that stuff. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, my, my wife, who is an ice cream connoisseur, says the brave robot is the best vegan ice cream that she's ever had. And, yeah. I, you know, she is she she has a high bar. So uh, anyway, point is that, um, you know, whole biomass fermentation is a different animal or maybe not an animal altogether. And um you know, it's exciting. It's really exciting that what we can do here. And as much as we have accomplished, there's a huge wide open road ahead of us and from the whole industry, not just our company at the Better Mico, but really all of the companies in this space are, are like exploring uncharted territory right now and figuring out how to produce like experience uh, instead of with plants, but with uh, with fungi. Yeah, it is really exciting. Before you had said, well, you see this as like a 1.0. I really see this as like a 0.001. I mean, just <laughs> yeah. be, well, because the microbial kingdom is so vast 
And we haven't really communicated with that kingdom at all to understand it. I, I'm not trying to be woo-woo when I say communicate, but just, you know, scientifically understand it and see how it works and use that to our advantage and really capitalize on its benefits, which are so many, um, not just in terms of how it performs, but what it naturally gives you from that nutrition package. So there's really so much to uncover there. And when you talk about clean energy, it reminds me of an interview that I did with Ethan Brown in my kitchen. Uh, and it was really sort of eye-opening to me when he said, you know, if only we were to invest in the alternative protein space, like we invest in the clean energy space. I mean, just right. think how further along we'd be to solving that issue. For us, it's animals, but for us, it's also people, right? Where there's so much food insecurity right now, um, has been for a while, nothing new. These problems aren't getting solved and they're only getting worse. So, um, you know, if only governments would get on board, it's kind of a different show. But, you know, some governments are. You see Europe and Canada and Israel and Singapore. But, you know, I'd love to see so much more coming from the United States, not just from investors in the private market, but also the public market. So lots to uncover yeah. there. Okay, my final my final comment where I uh, ask you more about the plant. Um, when I tasted Brave Robot... I was weepy because I was holding the end of animal agriculture in my hands. There's no reason you would ever choose a regular ice cream when you could have that without all the baggage. It just, and so I look forward to all this is to say, I look forward to tasting Risa because I, I think can. I'm going to feel the same way. Um, I, we want to roll out the red carpet for you, Elizabeth. We want you to come to Sacramento and uh, enjoy. We'll grow up. We will give you a whole suite. You'll get crab cakes. You'll get uh, steaks, chicken breasts, uh, fish sticks, a whole variety of things. We've got some awesome products that we can't wait for you to taste in the future of what now is called all protein. But in the future, I think it's just going to be protein. Yes, right. A hundred percent. That's right. It's just going to be protein. Uh, well, okay. Before we actually get the tour, because you are giving us a tour, tell us a little bit about your rays and how many square feet you have in this plant of yours, how much uh, product you produce a, a day, a week, a year. Sure. So uh, the Better Mico is still a small company. You know, we've raised about $12 million to date since our inception three and a half years ago. So, you know, that may seem to the uninitiated like a lot of money, um, but in this space, it's actually very small. Um, it takes a lot to, there's a lot of capital expenditure you need to do what we're doing, let alone the operating expenditures. So we're still a small team, but we're a small team that's doing big things, as you can see. This is the, actually the largest, uh, to my knowledge, it's the largest uh, whole biomass microprotein fermentation facility outside of corn in the UK, anywhere in the world. Um, so it's North America's largest microprotein fermentation facility. And to my knowledge, I mean, unless somebody else, you know, might be in self mode or something doing it, uh, to my knowledge, it's the biggest outside of corn anywhere in the world. Uh, so, you know, we can produce thousands of pounds a month. We cannot, though, produce millions of pounds. And that's what we really need to be doing. You know, you, you need to get to scale. And so we have a fermenter that's pretty big, but, you know, you need, you know, if you look at corn, I mean, they have numerous fermenters that are the size of office buildings. Right. You know, we're not talking here about something that goes up 20 or 30 feet. You're talking about something that goes up 100 feet or more. Um, and that's what we need. So we are going to raise a Series A in the fourth quarter of, of this year. So, you know, starting pretty soon and uh, raise a lot more money than we have in order to go out and build a full scale plant. So in, in fermentation, there's really four scales. So there's bench scale, there's pilot scale, there's demonstration scale, and then there's full scale. And we're at that third level right now. We're at the demonstration scale. So this is way more than a science experiment. You know, we can produce a lot of product, but not enough to supply like the Tysons or Purdue's of the world, right? We can supply smaller companies or pilot runs of product, but we can't supply, you know, somebody who wants to put us in thousands of grocery stores right now just because uh, the, the volume isn't there. So we're proud of what we've built here. It's something that I think is a, a real crown jewel of the uh, fermentation world, in my view. It's really wonderful and we're very proud of it. But we, we need to keep in mind that it is still a very small portion of what's needed. And even once we built our full scale plant, it still is gonna be a tiny little fraction of what's needed to actually make a dent in the problem. And so I'm rooting for the other companies in this space as well, whether they're doing uh, biomass fermentation or otherwise, because it's gonna take a lot to make a dent here, it's you know you, you know people underestimate just how much there how much um, road there is left to travel. You know you look at um, alternative meat today, and on a volume basis, it's still even in the United States way less than one percent of the total volume of meat that's produced. If you look at it by retail dollars, it's about one percent. But if you look at it 
the actual volume, which is what matters most from animal welfare or environmental perspective, you know, it's less than one percent of the meat that's produced is coming from non-animal sources. So we have so much to do. And that, you know, that's even with Morningstar and beyond and impossible. So all of that combined is still less than 1%. Uh, so, you know, we are um, enthusiastic about what we're doing, but also realistic that it's gonna take many oars in the water. We are gonna put a good oar in the water, but there's many more that are needed too. Mm-hmm. Yes, you know, our conversation, this is the second podcast that we've done together. So if, if you want to hear I'm more a, from I'm Paul honored. Shapiro, <laughs> please go back to previous plant-based business hours. And you'll find our, our long conversation there, which was so good. But one of the things that stays with me from that initial conversation is, is how adamantly you were saying meat consumption is growing. And even though plant-based consumption is growing, I use that sort of as the whole uh, category, fungi, microbes included, it's not denting meat production. It continues to grow, shows no signs of stopping. All of your clients are meat companies, which is why I loved your perspective. You're trying to go right to the source of the problem and see if you can get them to either do other products in full or at least in part. And they are building new plants and they're ramping up production. So is that still what you see? see out there and and the part one and then part two with this new kind of product are they thinking of anything beyond fillers are they seeing the opportunity for sure yeah so you know first i don't like to use the f word because our products enhance they do not fill they are enhancers that make it better however uh i'll say this the short answer is yes many of the meat companies view risa as a way to launch their own plant-based meat lines or their own animal free meat lines and that's that's a big interest for them. And, uh, you know, you know, right now there's a lot that's happening with pea protein and, and soy protein. Well, here's a way to differentiate and have, frankly, a better product. That's what we offer is a way to have a, a more meat like product. And so that's why folks are so interested in what we're doing. I think the, the interest is actually from our customers so far is frankly less in blending it into meat and more in creating um, new generations of animal free meat. Now, to answer your other question, Elizabeth, I hate to say it, but, you know, not much has changed. Meat consumption continues to grow. We're raising more animals for food than we ever have before. Um, and you're, you, you rightly point out that many of the meat companies, even those that are exploring plant-based meat, are building new slaughter plants. You know, they are not thinking that meat demand is going to go down. I mean, I, 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 you know, some of them are like, a, you know, one, uh, one uh, I think it was the but my memory serves me. It was the um, CEO of Cargill who recent, recently said that he, he did think that alternative meat would cannibalize uh, the regular meat industry. And of course, I hope he's right. Uh, but, you know, so far, you know, what we're seeing is demand for meat continues to rise, not just in the U.S., but around the world, especially the places where it's going to matter the most, China, Brazil, India. India. Places, you know, like those are the places that are going to make or break this. And so we're, we're leading poorly by example in the United States by maintaining such high levels of meat consumption. Um, and we're also leading poorly in that, as you noted, and as Ethan Brown noted, like the government just isn't doing that much on this. You know, we're already, you know, look at Asia, we're buying most of our solar panels and lithium ion batteries from Asia because their mm-hmm. governments have been especially the invested. Chinese, yeah, yeah they, they invested in those technologies and now we're gonna be reliant on them for clean energy. Well, we don't wanna be also reliant on them for clean protein. Uh, and so, you know, right now, uh, USDA just put out a notice last week in which they are soliciting comments for what meat from animal cell culture ought to be called. I think it's really important. It, you know, what we call this meat really matters as to w- how many people will buy it. And so, you know, you, you want something like cultivated meat as a name here because it, it's non-prejudicial, it's true, it's accurate. Whereas some of the other terms like, you know, that are you know um, being proposed, I, I think do more to turn people off from the product, frankly. Uh, you know, you have people in the meat industry seeking to call it things like lab-grown or artificial, or even some proponents who want to call it cell-based, whereas, you know, not that many people want to eat cells. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's not not that appetizing to think about eating cells. And so um, I'm, I'm a proponent of using things like cultivated meat or maybe even um, uh, cultured meat, um, but I'm con- Concerned that uh, what some of the meat industry are proposing will be, you know, mainly designed to protect the meat industry from this new type of meat industry rather than an accurate label. So anyway, uh, I recommend that folks make comments to the USDA on this and um, and uh, urge them to come up with something non-biased like uh, cultivated meat or cultured meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. And that link will be in the show notes for this so people can go to the USDA. And I think those comments are open for the next two months. 
something like that through yeah. the month of October. So go in and get your vote for cultivated or cultured meat. Uh, again, you have dropped so many bombs. I just want to be the little mouse behind you and pick up on some details. It was the CEO of Cargill who said that he Thank thought you. in the next three years that plant-based meat, again, speaking for the entire sector, would uh, cannibalize to the tune of 10%. I believe he was talking about the U.S. and not globally, but uh, right. I mean, that from, would be great. From, yeah, from his lips if, to the heavens, uh, yes, I, I, yeah. would, I would do an enormous amount to make that come true. Yeah, but other uh, meat companies that I've interviewed say that they see plant-based as a yes and, so not something that is swapping out, but it's just one more option while meat continues to grow. And I'll just keep in mind for everybody, you know, the average American eats between 220 and 240 pounds of meat a year. Now, I'm not eating any meat. Somebody's out there eating yeah. 400 plus pounds of meat. Paul's not eating any meat either. So these are yeah. astounding numbers. What used to be maybe the size of your palm three times a week at dinner is now super size me breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 21 meals a week. And no wonder right. everyone's dying from heart disease and the healthcare costs are rising. So, you know, it's still dire out there, even though the plant-based yeah. is really, um, advancing. Uh, okay. So just sharing those thoughts. Now let's get to the tour because we see you in all these pipes oh, and everything. So what are we going to get right. to see? And I will um, narrate for those people who are listening on audio. Yeah. So I'm a consumer of your, so Elizabeth, I consume your podcast by audio. So for all of you who aren't watching this, you do what I do. I feel your pain. So we're going to narrate here, but I'm going to actually start you out in our laboratory rather than the plant. You can see how things get started here. So uh, I don't know if I can flip my camera around. So I'm gonna go like this and show you. So what you're looking at here is a flask of actual mycelium. So that is uh, on a shaker table. And what you see there is uh, essentially aerating these microbes in there. So in the same way that you were going to, let's say take a glass of wine and swirl it around to release the aromatics, this is shaking in there so that you can get oxygen in so that they can breathe. Because remember, again, fungi breathe in oxygen. So that's why that's shaking in there. Now, if you want to look here, you can see this is what mycelium looks like. You see that uh, viscous white source in there, Elizabeth? That's yes. actual mycelium that's uh, swirling around in there. And now I'm going to show you our company vision. So uh, first, I got a couple colleagues of mine here, Moran Farhi and Catherine Rui, Hello. is their scientists here. And above them, you'll see we have a 40-foot mural on our wall here. And so I'll show you, this is a mural showing the evolution of human procurement of meat. So right behind me, you'll see for the first panel, it's a human, a hunter-gatherer trying to hunt a bison. And that, of course, gave way to cattle replacing bison and cowboys replacing indigenous people. And then you can move on to the inception of factory farming, really like in the um, oops, uh, really like in the 1950s or so, where uh, pigs started getting confined, but not so severely that they couldn't move. And then you come on over to the present day where chickens are crammed by the tens of thousands inside of windowless warehouses. But then you have a happier scene in the future. And in the future, it's a fermentation-fueled future where steaks are being produced and humans and animals alike are enjoying them. The bison are back on the land and we are producing uh, delicious, better meat co mycoprotein steaks that are satisfying the meat tooth that people seem to have without the need to actually raise and slaughter animals. So that is our corporate vision. And that's what we are doing here in the lab. Well uh, we have a question. Someone's asking, is this safe for consumption? So we've talked about, you know, all the benefits yeah. it has, but just go ahead and assure yeah. people. Well, one, one word answer. Yes, it is. In fact, it has a centuries history use of human consumption. That's very safe. So, all right. So we also have uh, two other folks in our lab here. I'll introduce you. We got Eduardo and hi. Prachi. Hi. You guys want to say hi to our friend Elizabeth? Hi. Uh, Prachi, hi. will you tell Elizabeth and her viewers what you're doing here? Yeah, we just is to analyze all the data. So I'm gathering all the samples that me and my colleagues collected, and I'll be running several different analyses on them so that it can inform future fermentation runs. Cool, thank you. All right, cool. so I'll bring you, bring you now in to um, show you 
but I don't think I can flip my camera on this platform. So I'm gonna have to show you like this, but so you can look here, you see this tank here? There you yeah. go. So you can see here. So this is where everything starts. So imagine Elizabeth that you're running a chicken farm again. We're going back to the Alfano farm. You know, you don't want uh, turkeys or raccoons in there or pigs. You want your chickens only in there. Well, same thing with us. We don't want any other organism. We only want our fungi. So we don't want bacteria. We don't want yeast. So that means that you basically have to sterilize what you put in there. And that's what we use this equipment for. We sterilize the food, which is you know, potato based uh, for them so that we can make sure that there's no competition with our fungi. We don't want any competition because not only do we want them to have access to all the food, we don't want to be paying to feed you know, bacteria, but they can outcompete the fungi and you get no growth also. So lots of reasons. So all of this that you're seeing here is designed for the purpose of essentially sterilizing the media, which is a fancy way of saying the food that you give to your microbes. So then you come over to this side and you'll see uh, what we have is we're running fermentations here that are where we put in things like potatoes. Uh, hold on, here we go. Things like potatoes, and you can look into this sight glass here and see, uh, you know, that's how you can watch the fermentation. But we put in things like potatoes and it goes into here and the, basically the microbes consume the potatoes. They convert the starch into a high protein food. So it goes in at, potatoes are about 1% protein. And then once, the fermentation is done, you have a product, Rhizo, that's about 45% protein. So within hours, you're going from a high starch food to a high protein food, just in the same way that a cow converts grass into a steak. Our little microbes are great at converting starchy foods into protein, high, into high protein foods. So after that all occurs, we take, we harvest the fermenter, we come into here where we have a downstream room where we can remove water from our product. So we have a series of equipment in here that basically are designed to squeeze water out. And so we squeeze, really, you know, we're talking about with plant-based and then on, on this side, you can see uh, more about what's happening here. And all of that is for the purpose of water removal. So, you know, in short, I was, I was talking earlier about all the things that you do to remove, uh, to get plants to have an animal-like texture. We just remove water. That's it. Yeah. It comes out of our fermenter and we remove water and that's it. That's really, we, we remove water and we chop it up. I mean, that's honestly the, the post harvest process that occurs. And because of that, you end up having really great economics. Uh, you don't have to do any like purification or isolation or extrusion or fractionation or any of the other things. And so it's a really advantageous system for that purpose. So you have now taken a virtual tour of the Better Meat Co's uh, factory here. Uh, but we'd invite you to come to Sacramento and come I check want it out to in person. Come. We, we're going to give you a, a sensory tour, not just a not just a visual tour. I guess and, visual and so, sensory, but we want you to taste this product. Is the end product a powder then, because you've dehydrated it? Uh, no, we turn it into a granule. So in the same way that, like, um, you know, uh, most uh, plant-based meat companies are buying granules of texturized plant proteins, right? They're using like texturized pea protein granules or texturized soy protein granules. Uh, we turn it into a granule. Okay, and then uh, you ship it in packages, and then yep. then they hydrate it, and they season it, or they fill it, whatever they do with it. So, um, yep. has anyone talked to you about because this is so meaty? Uh, first of all, a lot of meat companies, let's say hot dogs, they already have a lot of plant based fillers, so there already is this tradition, if that's the right word here, or habit procedure of putting plants as in as fillers because this is so meaty in taste and texture have your clients been talking about upping how much of the filler yeah. they put in uh yeah so you know first and foremost if you think about like um meat products that have plants added to them normally it's a very small percentage it might be like five percent maybe ten percent max because uh, you just start noticing the difference right away like you can mm -hmm. taste you can taste the difference is a textural difference whereas what we enable with the better meat is to go to much higher inclusion rates not you know, instead of five or ten percent you go like 30 40 50 percent depending on the application and so it enables you to do quite a lot that you couldn't otherwise do but again most people are using rhiza not as an ingredient in in blending into animal meat but really as the basis of a plant-based meat because it's just so much better than utilizing uh, plant proteins i mean there's just no getting around it it is superior in texture and versatility not to mention health and nutrition than extruded plant protein isolates that it's just it's 
Well, and not to mention cost and prolific nature of, you know, how much can be made and using less water, less resources, no hormones, no antibiotics, no, you know, none of these things that are currently going into the meat you eat, plant-based aside, but the, the meat that these companies are producing, ultimately, this is going to be much less expensive. So, and what I'm trying to say is this is a better business equation. Is, is that conversation happening? Yeah, it is. And so we're already in talks with uh, large food producers about their ability to get first in line treatment, for example, for our product when the full scale plant is complete. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that we're partnering with the best companies who are most highly motivated to do just that. But the cost is a big part of it. You know, we are right now, uh, like I said before, competing on cost of beef already at this scale. Now, I know you walk around, you look at this, it looks like a big scale, but you know, this is small yeah. compared to a food production plant. Um, you know, but once you build this thing at scale, you are talking about costs that are all of a sudden now for the first time ever are going to be cheaper than the cheapest meat. And there's nobody else doing that. There's no, you, know, you look on the market today and, you know, plant-based meat even today is still sold at much more expensive than animal-based meat, even today. I mean, companies as big as Beyond and Impossible are still not competing on cost. And, you know, these are companies that have massive amounts of money and it's not a knock on them. It's just to say that it's a difficult problem. It's a really yes. difficult problem to, to get to get to cost parity with meat. And those companies are saying that they don't think they'll be at uh, price parity for about three years. That's what Beyond Meat is projecting. So with um, with, with beef, which is, you know, which is, you know, much more expensive than chicken. Right. Right, right, right. So um, when will you have cost parity with chicken? Well, once our full scale plant is built, our model shows that we will be cheaper than chicken. So we are anticipating, uh, you know, from the time that we raise the funds to build this plant until the time that the plant is done, it could be as soon as 18 months. And then we'll have the cheapest alt meat on the market. And that's our goal. You know, the goal is not to create another product that's going to sell at multiples over the cost of meat. The goal for us is to actually you know, go from being a niche alternative product to being a mainstream product that we envision a river of rise up flowing out of our facility into the food industry, freeing animals from the exploitation we have wrought upon them and giving a better society for all of us. Reduced pandemic risk, reduced public health problems, reduced climate risks, decreased animal cruelty. The list goes on and on. Uh, you already are persuaded on this, Elizabeth, but I, I get evangelical on the benefits of RISA because I really think that it's one of the most hopeful technologies that there is to start reigning in the problem. Preach. Yeah. So I'll just add to that. Um, reduce antibiotic uh, resistance, reduce uh, worker injustice. I probably don't need to tell people that alcoholism and PTSD run rampant in um, communities that are around slaughterhouses. So there's lots to get behind, not to mention the democratization of meat. You know, how many people can afford a filet mignon? But when you start to produce meat in this way, not only do you produce more for more people, you produce it at um, more more uh, of approachable pricing that doesn't require subsidies. So now we're back to better business. Uh, okay, hey, that will be- we, We'll take some subsidies. We don't okay. mind taking them, but <laughs> sa sadly we have not benefited from them yet. Oh my word. Uh, we are running short on time. I know you have a meeting at the top of the hour, as do I. So I will ask you two very quick questions, uh, exit questions, and then say that I just hope that you come back and thank you for all you do. And thank you for moving the needle in a way like I just don't see very often. I'm so deeply grateful. Two quickie questions for you. What would you like to be known for? Uh, you know, I, I frankly don't care whether I'm known for anything when I die or not, because I won't have any interests. I believe it'll just be lights out and that's the end. However, what I do hope is that I do leave a legacy. Whether anybody knows about it or not is less important to me, but I do hope that I leave a legacy that the world was a better place because I was born. In other words, that there was less suffering and more happiness on the planet than if I had never been born. And, you know, we're causing suffering all the time, right? You know, we're, we're polluting, we're creating trash, we're hurting people's feelings, all the things that just are happen in our lives that we don't intend, but we're just sadly are doing. You have to compensate for that. And so my hope is that through my work that I can uh, more than adequately repay the debt and to end up with a world that has less suffering because I had existed. I think you're already doing this, fine, sir. And of course, then I mm -hmm. must plug your podcast, which very much stresses the same thing. It's the Business for Good podcast. So you like to highlight people who are also doing things for 
for animals, people, the planet, just making the world a better place by the time they left it than when they arrived. So again, thank you for all you do. Um, This is really a two-part question, but they are very short answers. Uh, You're having a bad day. Things aren't, the the plant isn't coming together. There's, you know, some leak somewhere. Gosh, so much could happen (laughs) in a big place like yours. Uh, What's the one phrase you say to get yourself back in the game? Uh, well, we have had leaks, actually, so I, I know exactly what I what I say, but it's not really a phrase I say to myself. I say it to Siri, which is, call Tony, who is my wife, and then I tell her about the problems, and then we talk about it, and then I feel better. So, uh, you know, uh, she's a great partner for me, and I am very, uh, very glad to call her in those times and burden her with my problems. <laughs> oh, such a wonderful partnership. Uh, last word from you. You're running around. You're so busy. You have no time for lunch. What's your go-to snack? Oh, Elizabeth, my go-to snack all the time is a sweet potato. So you just microwave it for a few minutes, put it in your bag, and then let it cool down to room temp, and then I eat it like an apple. So I love sweet potatoes. I try to eat one every day of my life. And um, I, I, my, my coworkers know that I love them so much that there was a secret Santa one time here. And uh, in a wonderful gift, uh, a coworker of mine gave me just a raw sweet potato, and I loved it. I was so happy. So yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big sweet potato fan. And I I am, you know, if people were eating like you know 220 pounds of meat per year, I don't know what one sweet potato weighs, but I'm eating about 365 of them a year. So I don't know how many pounds that is, but it's got to be like I'm, I am in the upper one percentile of of sweet potato consumers in the country. <laughs> My word, you are worth your weight in sweet potatoes. For those <laughs> yeah. people looking to do sweet potatoes, I'll say I like to dice them up and air fry them. So Ooh. they're sort of crunchy. I oh, like to take good. dandies, vegan marshmallows, and I put them in and I make like a real sweet thing around nice. Thanksgiving. And then if I'm staying on the healthier side, I like to add walnuts and cranberries. And that's oh. dinner for me. How, how really long big is, sweet potato. And then. How, how long in the air fryer, Elizabeth? About 20 minutes. Okay, so you don't like microwave first. You just chop them and put them in there for 20 minutes. Okay. Light, All right. Lightly coated with a little bit of olive oil, but super light, like super just okay. a spray thing. And then I, I move on and I chop them and there they go. I'm on it. Uh, I'm going to experiment with this. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll text you a photo to show you how it goes, okay? That's wonderful. Paul Shapiro, I want to thank you so much. You stay put. Everybody else on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, thanks for being here. I will see you next Tuesday. Paul, stay around. Bye, everybody.